Today, let's talk about playing backup, playing rolling backup to be more specific. It's one of those things that is so integral to the sound of bluegrass banjo, and it's something that all banjo players want to be able to do, but at the same time, it's the thing that most banjo players struggle with the most. And I know from experience that going from the beginner stages of playing to the banjo to that next level, playing rolling backup on bluegrass tunes, real bluegrass banjo, that's a big leap. That can be really difficult. Or it can feel that way anyway, because when we talk about players like Earl Scruggs or J.D. Crow and their amazing backup, then we're usually thinking about really cool examples of backup like this. And that's really great, and that's not unattainable for you or pretty much anyone who's trying to play the banjo. But that's not really where we should be starting when we talk about rolling back up. So today, let's look at some really simple patterns that you can play on just about any tune, in any key, in 4-4 four, four, or 3-4, that are going to work pretty much no matter what. And this is going to be our foundation, what we build everything else on top of. But if we don't build that foundation first, then we're going to run into problems. So let's not waste any more time. Let's just get into these patterns and apply them to a bunch of different situations. And along the way, hopefully, I can share with you different ways that you can use this information and keep it so that it stays part of your language. By the way, if you want PDF files of all of the tablature from this lesson, as well as a bonus practice tip, then you should go to patreon.com slash Eli Gilbert Banjo. That's where I post everything that you can't find here on YouTube. Also, do me a huge favor real quick and subscribe to this channel and like this video. It's one of the things that makes these videos possible, and I really appreciate it. So as banjo players, we spend a lot of time playing in the key of G and playing a G chord. So let's just start there. Here's a really simple way to play rolling back up on a G chord for two measures. Now, for some of you, even this might be a little too complicated, but we can make it a lot easier. What if we just look at the first measure? What can we call the things that we're looking at here? Well, the first thing is we play one quarter note, or one longer note. And then we play what would be called two forward rolls. If you're not familiar with the roll patterns yet, then that's not that big a deal. Just think about it as any pattern that goes thumb, index, middle. So we have one quarter note, and then two patterns of thumb index middle, or a forward roll. That's our first unit. Why don't we just play that one measure a couple times in a row? Now, that in itself actually sounds pretty good already, but we do want to stretch that phrase out to two full measures. So now let's look at the second half of our two measure pattern. Again, if you're familiar with roll patterns, then you might call this a forward reverse roll or a forward backward roll, however you prefer to call it. But either way, let's just play this one measure a couple times in a row just to make sure that this feels comfortable. If you can do that, then I bet you can combine both of those measures into our full two-measure phrase. Let's give that a try. Just play that two-measure phrase as slowly as you need to a couple of times. And I know right now that might not seem like much, and I know it doesn't involve a lot of the other techniques that you'll hear when you hear pro banjo players play. But this pattern is actually pretty versatile. Listen to what happens if I play this up to speed. Even without any frills, without fretting any notes, you still get a hint of what that real bluegrass sound is. So as long as we can focus on that while we're playing this pattern, then we're really going to get an idea of what we're going to be sounding like 
when we do add in other elements. Now, before we think about any other chords and any other patterns, we have one pattern under our belt and it applies to one chord. But think about it more like this is just an option that we have. When you see a G chord or when you're playing a song with a G chord, you can play this pattern. Obviously, this exact two measure pattern works best for two measures of G. But what if you came across one measure of G? Well, you could play just the first half or you could play just the second half. If you come across something like four measures of G, then that's easy. All you have to do is play the full two measure pattern twice. But if you come across something like three measures of G, that's actually still pretty easy. You just play the two measure pattern and then the first half of the two measure pattern. Two plus one is three. It really doesn't have to be that much more complicated than that. So as we build on this, as we add different patterns or different chords, think about these as building blocks that you can just use at will. And really when you do that, you'll kind of be improvising because you're either choosing to use the first half of a pattern or the second half of a pattern or the full pattern. All of these things are choices that you're making. And if you can get in the habit of making choices while you play, then it's not gonna feel too difficult to add in a new lick or to choose between two licks that you like or maybe a hundred licks that you like. So even though I've only showed you one pattern for one chord at this point, if I told you play a two measure pattern for G, then you'd be able to go back in your memory and say, do I know something for that? Yes, I do. And then you'd be able to play it. And the more we add, it's really the same process. You're just going back in your memory and saying, do I have something for this situation? And then you apply it. Right now it's easy because we just have one situation that we need to handle and we've got a perfect solution to it. But what happens if we add another chord? Well, let's do that and find out. Now let's play a pattern that's gonna work for a C chord. Now, you might have noticed already that we don't even use all the notes in the chord shape that I just showed you, and that's fine. That actually happens all the time. That's a good thing to keep in mind that when we're playing bluegrass backup, the point isn't to play every note in the chord shape all the time. In fact, in some of the shapes I'm gonna show you, you're only gonna fret one note. You're only gonna be playing two notes out of the entire chord sometimes. That's really not a big deal. That's part of the sound of bluegrass, so don't worry too much about that. Just remember that there are other notes in the chords that you may use for other licks. Okay, so back to this pattern for C. It's different from the one in G, but at the same time, it's kind of not. It's actually kind of the same thing. Notice that the first measure is made up of a quarter note and two forward rolls. And then the second measure is made up of that forward backward roll. It's really the same thing, just adjusted slightly to different strings and different fretted notes in the left hand. And because we're playing a different chord, meaning different notes, and the pattern is sufficiently long enough, it actually feels like there's enough variation in what we're doing. If we played a bunch of really short patterns, it would feel awfully repetitive. But there's something about these two patterns going back to back that don't really feel too repetitive. But you don't necessarily have to just jump in and combine all these things right away. You might still have to start with just the first measure of that pattern in C, like this. And then move on to playing just the second half, like this. Then you can move on and play the full two measure pattern in C. Now you might've noticed that we're kind of building towards playing a chord progression in the key of G and we'll get there. But for right now, let's just put the G pattern and the C pattern together like this. But don't worry if you're not quite there yet. That's part of the process is putting these things together. So when you do that, 
Try practicing just the first two measures, G, and then land on the first note of the pattern in C, just like this. Because even if you can play all of the measures in G and all of the measures in C, that doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be easy to transition from one to another. So focus on that moment of transition. If you need to, you can even play the last note of the two measures of G and the first note of the two measures of C, just to see how that feels. And then you can build that pattern out from there until you're playing the entire sequence. Just remember that whatever moments that you're struggling with on a regular basis, maybe a note that you miss or a transition between one chord to another that has a big gap in it, that's where you really wanna focus your attention. Don't waste your time with the notes that you can already play well. Focus on the things that you struggle with. And again, we really wanna be thinking about all this material as being modular, meaning we can break apart different pieces of it and we can put them in different orders depending on what the song calls for. So if it was two measures of G and two measures of C, then that's what we would play. But what if we're playing something that's three measures of G and one measure of C? Well, again, if we do that kind of simple math, we could play the two measure pattern of G and then half of the two measure pattern of G and then half of the two measure pattern of C. That's three measures of G and one measure of C, like this. And this is what's going to enable you to play rolling back up on any song as long as you have patterns for each chord. You don't really have to have a special backup arrangement for each song, you just have to have some material that you can use in a lot of different places. And even though someone like me has learned a lot of licks, I still use them the same way. I see them as these one measure or two measure or three measure phrases that I can apply to different songs depending on whether or not they fit. So just for good measure, let's go over another pattern for the chord D. That'll sound like this. Now this definitely won't surprise you that it's again pretty much the same pattern. It's a quarter note followed by two forward rolls. That's the first measure. And then the second measure is again the forward backward roll. And in this situation, the only notes that we're playing are D and A. We're not even playing an F sharp. It's kind of a boring sounding chord, but in the context of a bluegrass band, in the context of what the job of the banjo player is, this is sufficient and it actually sounds pretty cool. And if I put all of that together, G, C, and D, and maybe go back to G again at the end, it sounds like I'm playing bluegrass, like this. Okay, just using what we have now, knowing that we can use these two measure phrases and chop them up as needed and put them in whatever order we want, we can play a huge amount of the bluegrass library. So here's some examples of backup on some really popular bluegrass progressions.
And as you may have noticed, I didn't do anything special here. I just used the right patterns at the right time. The thing is, I've actually practiced this a lot, so it's really easy for me to do. If this is the first time you're looking at this, then it's my guess that you're not going to take to it quite as quickly as I have. Hopefully by now you understand the process that we're using to get there. But just the intellectual understanding of it really doesn't help you play it. We actually need to build some muscle memory. So if you want to do that, this is what my thought process would be if I was trying to figure this out from the beginning. I'd start by looking up what the chords are for any song that I'm interested in. Let's say I want to play a song like Nine Pound Hammer. If I went online and looked up the chords, I'd find something like two measures of G, followed by a measure of C, followed by a measure of G, a measure of D, and then back to G again. This is pretty much how most people play Nine Pound Hammer, and a lot of the time, bluegrass musicians play it out of a G position. So that's great for what we already have. But if I can't already remember what all the patterns are, and I don't know how to transition between them, then I kind of only just have that intellectual understanding of what I'm supposed to do. So right now, that actually might mean writing out exactly what you're going to play with these backup patterns. And that would look like this. And the more songs you apply this to, the easier it's going to be to do it on the fly. For instance, if you've practiced something like Blue Ridge Cabin Home, that's just G, C, D, and G, you're going to actually be able to play a lot of songs that have that exact chord progression, and you won't need to practice anything extra. So if you apply this to all the songs that you know, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to be able to use this on the fly in a lot of other situations where you're not technically prepared. But really, you'll always be prepared. So give it a try and really dig into it. If you take literally only one thing from this entire lesson, let it be that in order to use any of the material that you learn, either from my lessons or any other place, you have to build the experience of using it. That's going to give you the muscle memory, and then you're going to be able to play it when you want to. Just knowing about something and just knowing how to do something and just knowing what you're supposed to do is not going to help you do those things. It can point you in the direction of what you want to be able to do, but if you don't actually start doing it, you're out of luck. Okay, so now let's extrapolate a little bit from the patterns that we've used and the chords that we've used. We're playing only in the key of G so far, and we've only played major chords. But if we just think about what this pattern is, we can really apply it to any chord shape that we know of, because it's really going to be the same two-measure phrase to begin with. It's just a quarter note and two forward rolls for the first measure, and then a forward-backward roll for the second measure. So if I apply that concept to a bunch of other chord shapes, then I'm kind of going to get the same result. And here are a few examples of that. Obviously, that vastly expands our opportunities when it comes to playing different songs in different keys, both major and minor chords. That's basically everything we need to play just about any bluegrass song that's been written so far. Again, it just comes down to your willingness to learn what the chords of a certain song are and then apply these patterns to them. And obviously, this isn't all you're ever going to want to play on these songs, but again, this is the foundation because in the subsequent lessons that I'm going to be posting next week and the week after that, we're going to be talking about other things that you can play in place of these patterns. So do your homework now and learn these patterns and use them on songs that you like so that when I give you more patterns to use, you'll be ready. Okay, so as useful as all of that is, it kind of only tells part of the story. 
That's going to be really useful if you want to play rolling back up in 4-4. Four, four. But what about playing in 3-4 timing? That's a whole other ballgame, and it's something that even fewer banjo players know how to deal with. But what's great is that we can use similarly simple patterns to play any song in any key in 3-4. We just have to adjust for the fact that there's one less beat in each measure. And what's nice about this pattern is it's actually even simpler than the one I showed you for 4-4. Four, four. This is what it sounds like in G. Now, one way to interpret this is just as one quarter note and a bunch of forward rolls. So we're just playing one note and then we're repeating thumb index middle until the end of the two measures where we start over again. But again, because all of this stuff is modular and we wanna be able to use it in a lot of different ways, we should be good at playing each half of this pattern. So let's just play the first measure of this two measure pattern. And now let's use the second measure of this two measure pattern. Finally, let's put it all together. What's nice about this pattern is that obviously it fits well into the three, four time signature, but it also means that every two measures, we have a strong downbeat that tells us exactly when a new measure is starting, which is good because for instance, if we play two measures of each chord, it's nice to have something strong at the beginning of that chord. So let's talk about playing another chord like C. Here's the pattern that I would play for C. Again, it's just the quarter note and a bunch of forward rolls, or just a quarter note and thumb index middle until the end of the two measures, but it serves the purpose well. And if you remember the 4-4 patterns that we talked about earlier, then you can probably guess what the rest of the patterns I'm going to talk about are, because we're really just applying this principle to all of the chords that we talked about earlier, like this. Okay, so that's all great, but again, I'm going to be a broken record about this and say that this material is not useful to you unless you practice it and apply it to chord progressions and songs. So here's how this pattern could be applied to a couple of different chord progressions in 3-4.
Okay, so technically, with all the material that I've showed you, as simple as it is, and as repetitive as it is, you're actually empowered to play pretty much anything in the Bluegrass catalog now with Rolling Backup. And I mean that because they're really just made up of songs that are in 4-4, songs that are in 3-4, songs with major chords and minor chords. And yes, I know it's not yet the most interesting thing that you could play, but the thing that I notice with a lot of people is they dive in with some really difficult material, with some really cool, interesting ideas that never really come to fruition and cause a lot of frustration. So let's just get rid of all that frustration and work on these simple things first, because next week, when we start making it a little bit more interesting, you'll be ready. So do that homework, work on these patterns, check out Patreon for more content, subscribe to this channel and like this video, and I will see you next week. Thanks for watching.